Uh, so as I make this video, this is, uh, I want to be very clear. People will understand why I'm starting with this video, which is Tulsi Gabbard at a Freedom Festival, explaining the importance of freedom of speech. Now, one of the things that you might not understand is Texas and a couple other states, like uh, La Florida, have uh, tried to pass laws, and in some cases have passed laws, to illegalize the boycotting of Israel. Okay, now I don't agree with Tulsi Gabbard on some of these things, in particular regarding uh, the situation in Eastern Europe. Now, that being said, I would still vote for Tulsi Gabbard out of all of the current people running for office, although she has not stated that she's running for office, I would still vote for Mrs. Gabbard, or Ms. Ms. Gabbard, because she's married, but, you know, her maiden name is Gabbard, and I guess, whatever. My point is, I would vote for her because I think she's the best candidate. Number one, I also think she's the most honest candidate. I think with Ms. Gabbard, we know what we're getting. Or should I call her former representative Gabbard? I don't know what to call her. But my point is, with Tulsi, we know what we're getting. She's not putting on a mask or trying to hide or anything like that. But the reason I'm starting this like this is because the most important thing that we need in the preservation of this republic is the preservation of our freedom of speech, the First Amendment. And now in the First Amendment, you also have freedom of religion. So let's see what uh, Ms. Gabbard is saying here. There's a representative landsman from Ohio who said, quote, why are we being asked to ban American officials from trying to stop propaganda from foreign adversaries like Putin? Why are some proposing we leave Syria, which Putin wants? Why is the call to abandon Ukraine continuing to emerge from some members? He goes on to say, remember, and I'm quoting him, remember, Hitler did this. He used Americans to... Now, this is a common theme. Everybody compares everybody to Hitler. Hitler this and Hitler that. When Obama Salama was in office, everybody was like, Obama Salama is Hitler. And I think there were billboards with Obama with a little Hitler mustache, which is utterly ridiculous. And then it was Donald Trump is Hitler. So-and-so is Hitler. Now Putin is Hitler. Everybody's Hitler. Everybody the radical left doesn't like. Everybody the so-called right doesn't like. Everybody is Hitler to these people. This is a common thing because Hitler is in the zeitgeist as the ultimate evil. He is the devil to these people. You dig what I'm saying? And I'm quoting him. Remember, Hitler did this. Actually, more importantly, he is the devil to the American public. That's the problem. Because the American public are too stupid to actually pick up a book or read you know we have freedom of speech in this country freedom of the press maybe people should read a certain book written by a certain dude from germany and see where that dude was coming from and realize you know there aren't any real devils or demons in this world the only devils and demons are the bad choices we make and people are prone to make bad choices some people are bad people don't get me wrong, but it works to understand where people are coming from. Some people are crazy, and I think that's the situation we're dealing with now in Eastern Europe is somebody is not exactly wrapped too tightly, but let's let Ms. Gabbard continue. And I'm quoting him. Remember, Hitler did this. He used Americans to spread his propaganda and it cost millions their lives. Putin is doing the same thing. So to be clear, this congressman from Ohio feels that Americans who dare to say, hey, we need to stop writing blank checks to fund this proxy war against Russia via Ukraine must be silenced. 
He feels that anyone who says, hey, we need to bring our troops home from Syria are Russian propagandists and must be silenced. This is dangerous because this is coming from people who are in great positions of power to actually act on this nonsense. Now, so far, the Senate has refused to take up this legislation that was passed by Republicans in the House. The court has taken action, banning the federal government from having any contact with social media companies for the purpose of censoring free speech. The Biden administration's response, again, was very bold. They are blatant. They're not even trying to hide it. They said that they're challenging this ruling because they're concerned it will limit their attempts to counter domestic extremism. Who gets to say what domestic extremism is? Well, who gets to say what domestic extremism is? Well, who gets to say what domestic extremism is? Well, we can look to them because we know what they say. President Biden declared MAGA Republicans and Trump supporters as the greatest threat to our democracy. Maybe he's referring to, maybe they are referring domestic extremists to the quote, radical traditional Catholics that the FBI has deemed a threat. Why? Well, in part because they prefer traditional Latin mass. Prefer traditional Latin mass. Maybe it's the pair prefer traditional Latin mass. That's important to consider because you must remember that part of the First Amendment is what? Freedom of religion. These people are blatantly working to violate the Constitution. Maybe it's the parents who are going to Board of Education meetings and protesting against the overt sex sexualization of their kids that's happening. Sexualization of their kids that sexualization of their kids that's happening in our schools or those who stand up and protest the irreversible mutilation of our kids in the name of, name of gender affirming care now remember this is not just the radical left you got people in the local government like brian fitzpatrick that dis that support these abominations you have people that have recently run for office like dr mehmet oz that support these abominations they're both republicans so keep that in mind this is a uh, unity of stupidity at the highest levels these are the people that our government the biden administration sees as domestic extremists these are the people that they want to silence the biden administration also expressed that this court ruling would cause, quote, great harm. They're telling the truth. It would cause great harm to their power. 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 You have to keep that in mind. That is the one thing that we have in this country is the ability to question those in power. And that ability to question really matters because it can affect the vote. And people that think their vote doesn't matter, if, the, if people's votes didn't matter, why would the people in power try so hard to control the way that you vote if your vote didn't matter? to their ability to control us by controlling what information we are allowed to read, what we are exposed to, whose voices we are allowed to hear. What's dangerous about all this is they're directly and indirectly using the national security state and law enforcement, the propaganda media and big tech, all working together in this cabal to silence those who hold views they find objectionable and therefore who threaten their power threaten their power threaten their power threaten their power they try to intimidate us 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 into silence into self-censorship into silence into self-censorship into silence into self-censorship by using their smear attack and destroy tactics 
by using their smear attack and destroy tactics. By using their smear attack and destroy tactics. Hillary Clinton used it against me during the 2020 presidential campaign. Hillary Clinton used it against me during the 2020 presidential campaign. Hillary Clinton used it against me during the 2020 presidential campaign. Hillary Clinton used it against me during the 2020 presidential campaign. When she said I'm a traitor. When she said I'm a traitor. When she said I'm a traitor. A lie that was repeated over and over and over again. People. A lie that was repeated over and over and over again. People. A lie that was repeated over and over and over again. People actually believed this baseless lie. This baseless lie. This baseless lie. Mitt Romney called me a treasonous liar. Mitt Romney called me a treasonous liar. Mitt Romney called me a treasonous liar. Which, as a soldier, is an offense punishable by death. Again, presenting no evidence, but called... Now, Mitt Romney is your typical mamby-pamby Republican. Your white bread, milk toast Republican. Okay, so he is not the radical left. He's basically the center left. And he's throwing these things out, accusing this young lady, this, this person that sacrificed her life for your freedom of being a traitorous liar. Now, that's outrageous. And like Ms. Gabbard states, calling a soldier a traitorous liar is punishable by capital punishment under the UCMJ, which is absolutely awful. And he just throws that out there. Nobody cares. Nobody says anything. Nobody calls him out on his shit besides Tulsi Gabbard. Me this because I said, hey, there are U.S. funded bio labs in Ukraine that the Department of Defense has reported that in the midst of a war could be compromised and create yet another global pandemic and crisis. We should probably do something about that. That was grounds for being called a treasonous liar. Anyone who stands up and says, hey, we should not be the policemen of the world. We should not be waging regime change wars around the world. Their, their label for us is you're a dictator lover, lover. You're a stooge for whatever dictator is in question. Senator Rand Paul being called a, a Putin puppet because he says we should have some accountability for the money and weapons. Senator Rand Paul being called a, a Putin puppet because he says we should have some accountability for the money and weapons. Senator Rand Paul being called a, a Putin puppet because he says we should have some accountability for the money and weapons that we are sending to Ukraine. And as you can see, their victims, their victims are not just the left or the, cent or the center or the right. It is the left, the center, and the right that they victimize. Senator Rand Paul is, of course, far to the right of Ms. Gabbard here. But the point is... These attacks are being levied against the people that are on the side of the American people. And that needs to be understood because these are the people that need to be elected and re-elected. These are the people that need to hold the, uh, the executive office. I would love to see a Gabbard Rand Paul ticket. Uh, when Trump was running in the 2020, uh, I mean, in 2016, I wanted Rand Paul to win. But when I saw Rand Paul was too much of a sissy to stand up to Mr. Trump, I realized Trump was going to win due to name recognition and things like that. But obviously, Rand Paul was the better choice. And obviously, Ms. Gabbard here, who was actually supported by Rand Paul's father, Ron Paul, Ron Paul supported Ms. Gabbard. Uh, I think Ms. Gabbard here is the ultimate of ultimate choices. Great. Reasonable request in the wake of all of the waste and fraud and abuse that we saw for the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. We're seeing the same thing happen with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. right now. They're throwing everything but the kitchen sink at him Again, the left. to try to They're discredit left him person. as a person and call his character into question so that voters don't pay attention to him. They've used these tactics over and over and over again because they work. Most because they work. Because they work. 
because they work. Most people don't want to go through what we have been through and what we continue to go through. Most people don't want to be called these names. Most people don't want to be on the receiving end of these attacks and therefore resort to self-censorship. End of these attacks and therefore resort to self-censorship. End of these attacks and therefore resort to self-censorship. So as promised, when we came back, and I didn't lie, we would be covering Tengrism. And Tengrism is an important feature of the human, of human history, an important religious feature of human history. And the reason we're covering Tengrism is of great, it's of great importance to what I believe are part of the social reforms necessary to help our people move forward, okay? So over the centuries from ancient times, a remarkable range of religions and cultures have affected the people of the huge territory compri comprising of today's Kazakhstan. Among these influences, there were at least Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Shamanism, Jude Judaism, Nestorianism, Taoism, Christianity, and eventually Islam. But before any of the religions mentioned, there was Tengrism. The spur of Tengrism was the steppes itself. It's the indigenous religion of this area. The vast range. Now remember I said that the people that brought Hinduism to India were from Central Asia. This is that area. This is that area where the Chukchi are where they, you know, so this enormity and emptiness brought into being one of the most significant systems of belief on earth, a great combination of monotheism and polytheism that is identified as Tengrism. The concept of Tengrism, the religion named after the supreme deity Tengri, or the sky, grew out of the primal heathen pantheism. Primal heathen pantheism the equation of nature with the Almighty, okay, into a coherent and lively faith in unity of all things that continued to live alongside Islam and Christianity into the Middle Ages, okay, in the souls of the Kazakhi, the Kazakhstan and, Mongol and Mongolia even today, some traces of Tengrism can also be found in Kurzi pilgrimage sites, Tengri beliefs can still be widely seen in all Central Asian countries with the tradition of worshipping natural wonders, but nowadays they are mostly combined with Muslim beliefs and the pilgrimage sites have nowadays mostly legends uh, somehow associated with Islam, even though they were, uh, they have been worshipped already for a long time before Islam came to Central Asia. The word Tengri uh, was obtained from the ancient runic inscriptions found in Kazakhstan and interpreted by the Danish scholar Wilhelm Thompson in, in 1893. The Turkic origin of the word is no longer in doubt. The idea of Tengri in all its beauty appeared at the time of the Turks in the most ancient sign and eventually took form as a pagan country dwell as pagan country dwellers religion at the time of the Huns early state the cult of the substance of heaven uh, Kuk Tengri according to the investigator of Tengrism Kutlue Erg Erdogan uh, I, as well as the cult of the substance of being, of earth, uh, which is Jer Ten, uh, Tenri, was characteristic of the Turkic tribes inhabiting all regions of ancient Central Asia. For these nomads roaming the steppe, moving their herds from one pasture to the next, the heavens and mountains, the hills, the rivers, the trees, and the creatures were all holy manifestations of the one single whole worthy of, ador of adoration. 
emerging from contacts with Indian, Tibetan, and Chinese cultures, the Tengrist cult was perceived as its root by the ideas of Buddhism with its characteristic hierarchy of spirits, often represented on the ground by animals. These spirits were loci of either evil or good. To avoid the disfavor of evil forces, men were to win the favor of the forces of good. Genghis Khan and his followers are also known to be strong followers of Tengri. Tengrism rituals. Various sacrificial rituals were performed by shamans at elaborate ceremonies. So the shamans were like the priests of the Tengrism, of, of Tengrism. Seeking salvation from the spirits of sickness and poverty and admission into the afterlife to one of 17 levels of Tengri's heavens, these shamans or Kams clearly... Now, you can see a lot of this, a lot of this is still in Buddhism, if you're familiar with Buddhism. If you're not familiar with Buddhism, I'd suggest you become familiar with Buddhism. Uh... After sprinkling the sacred hearth with, kum with fermented horse's milk, which would kind of be like kefir, but made with horse's milk, the shaman would fall to the ground in ecstatic shaking and would start narrating, often rhythmically, to collective chanting. Something allegorical to be interpreted by the gathering and seized upon as revelation. The rituals customarily were executed at the summits of hills or in the mountains or on riverbanks. Now, this is similar to mediumship. I'm going to do a series of videos on spiritualism and spiritism or white Anglo-Saxon Tengrism. Drawing upon numerous sources, the 20th century Turkish scholar Abdul Kadar Bin has enlightened, has highlighted, I'm sorry, the role of the stone cairns or uba, such as still survive in the Altai Mountains and the southern Urals. They were built by the ancients as votive structures for the spirits of the mountains. The highest peak of the Tian Shan inevitably took the name of the deity Mount Tengri. Rising against a background of endless spaces of the steppe, the soaring and virtually unsaleable mountains naturally presented themselves as a physical bridge between earth and heaven, words whose root implied height. Some became synonymous with the divine. This led to the ultimate narrowing of the idea of height to the concept of the one god Tengri, proclamation in effect of monotheism. In the 6th century, Tengrism suffered an assault by Christianity. In the 7th, it survived the endeavor of Judaism to penetrate the territories of Tengris adherents. By the, birth, by the birth of Islam in the 7th century and its militant sweep across Asia in the ensuing generations, Tengrism was subtly enhanced and refined with all the attributes of a millennium of old religion. Uh, temples, priests, prophets, a verbal tradition, and written canons. Uh, for several centuries, yet, it was to prove an effective competitor with all other more codified and more dogmatic religions. One, uh, only in the 15th century, was it overwhelmed by Islam. Uh, yet, it is still evident in prayer. Now, when I, uh, I might actually add a little thing about the Kalasha people of Pakistan in here. Uh, so, what do we got going on here? So, religions in Central Asia. Okay. So, Luram Ipsum uh, Dolar Sit Amat. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Let's see. Okay, moving forward. That had nothing to do with it. So, who is Tengri? Uh, Tengri is romanized as Cook Ten, uh, Tenri, or Tenri, uh, literally means the blue heaven, which is an old Uyghur word, uh, Middle Turkic, Ottoman Turkish, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, let's see here. Tengri is not considered a deity in the usual sense, but a personification of the universe. So, this is true pantheism. 
However, some qualities associated with Tengri as judge and source of life and being eternal and supreme led to uh, led European and Muslim writers to identify. Now, what's funny, European and Muslim. These were probably Muslims from Europe. <laughs> so the Muslims are European too. People forget that there are Muslims in Europe. Spain was Muslim for a while there. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so Tengri as a deity of Turkic and Mongolian people. According to Mongolian belief, Tengri's will may break its, on its own usual laws and intervene by sending chosen people or a chosen person to earth. This is similar to the concept of an avatar in Hinduism or the Bodhisattva and Buddhism. Uh, this is the concept behind the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, people familiar with the Hare Krishna tradition of Hinduism. Uh, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, uh, a physical entity, Krishna, comes to earth to lecture Arjuna on uh, virtues and nonsense like that. You can read the Bhagavad Gita. It's a wonderful book. I recommend people read. Uh, the best... The best version of the Bhagavad Gita that I have found is the Bhagavad Gita as it is, which is from ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Worship surrounding Tengri is called Tengrism. The core beings in Tengrism are the Sky Father and Earth Mother. It involves shamanism, animism, totemism, and ancestor worship. Okay. So this is going back into it. The name, blah, 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 blah. You can read this all on your own. So the great spirit is a concept of a life force, a supreme being, more so a life force, or God, known more specifically as Wakantanka in Lakota, Gichi Manatu in Algonquin, and by other specific names. Now, Remember, one of the splits from that region was the Mongols, was the Native Americans, okay? So from Central Asia, you have the Indo-Aryans, which are the people of Europe and the people of, uh, and the people of Iran and the people of India. And then you have the Mongols, which are the people of Mongolia, China, Japan, etc., 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 uh, and uh, then you have from the Mongols another split, which is the Amerindians. Now, you will notice a great, 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 great uh, similarity between, between Tengrism and particularly what has survived from Tengrism, which is just the shamanism, all, all the way down the Americas, everywhere there's Mongols, whether it's Mongolia, China, you will notice it. But you will also notice it all throughout the New World, from Alaska to Chile, from Alaska to Orangina. The Great Spirit has at times uh, been conceptualized. Now, but this is what you have to understand. The Great Spirit does not belong only to the Mongol people. It belongs to humanity. Okay, this is a human concept. This is the religion that everyone had before the false religions of, you know, worshipping uh, oogity boogities and all this. This, is, this goes back to the pure religion of nature. Okay. Due to perceived similarities between the Great Spirit and the Christian concept of God, colonial European missionaries frequently use such existing beliefs as a means of introducing indigenous Americans to Christianity. Now, what you need to know is by the time people came here, what you have in Native American religions is similar to the Egyptian religion. Remember how I said there was one supreme God and then the Nataru. The Nataru being nature spirits. In Amerindian religion, it's the same deal. You have the great spirit. Some people uh, uh, basically make it anthropomorphic, uh, like the Inca, they had Viracocha. Okay, but then you have 
uh, usually the great spirit is seen as amorphous, non-anthropomorphic, uh, and then you have nature spirits like rabbit and coyote and fox and things like this nature, or jaguar in South America. So, the great spirit has at times been conceptualized as an anthropomorphic celestial deity, at times, a god of creation, history, and eternity. Numerous individuals are held to have been speakers for the Great Spirit. Okay, between humans and supernatural, uh, more generally, such a speaker is generally considered to have an obligation to preserve the spiritual traditions of their respective lineage. The Great Spirit is looked to by spiritual leaders for guidance by individuals as well as communities at large. While belief in an entity or entities known as the Great Spirit exists across numerous indigenous American peoples, individual tribes demonstrate varying degrees of cultural divergence. Okay, so that's important. So let's talk about Wakantanka. Wakantanka can be interpreted as the power or the sacredness that it resides in everything. It is an animistic and pantheistic belief. This term describes every creature and object as wakan, meaning holy, or having aspects that are wakan, meaning holy. The element of tanka corresponds to great or large. So it means great sacred or great mystery as it's usually translated as. Prior to Christianization of indigenous Americans by European settlers and missionaries, the Lakota used Wakantanka to refer to an organization or group of sacred entities whose ways were considered mysterious and beyond, beyond human understanding. It was the elaboration on these beliefs that prompted the scholarly debate suggesting that the term great mystery could be more accurate, a more accurate translation of the concept of the then Great Spirit. Activist Russell Means also promoted the translation as Great Mystery, and view that Lakota spirituality is not originally monotheistic. Okay, so Wakantanka, the Great Spirit, there came great. Okay. So from Wakantanka, the Great Spirit, there came a great unifying force that flowed in and through all things, the flowers of the plains, plowing winds, rocks, trees, birds, animals, and was the same force that had been breathed into the first man. Thus all things were kindred and were brought together by the same great mystery. Notice the correlations between this and the concepts in the Garden of Eden. Okay. Manatu. Manatu is akin to the Iroquois Orenda, is perceived as the spiritual and fundamental life force by the Algonquin people. It is believed by practitioners to be omnipresent, manifesting in all things including organisms, uh, the uh, environment and events both human-induced and otherwise. Manifestations of Manitou are also believed to be dualistic. Now, this is very similar to the concepts of Taoism. Now, Taoism is more or less an evolution into a more organized form of shamanism. So, it's Taoism is more or less the reestablishment of Tengrism in the sense that it is taking the more disordered shamanism and putting it to order and systematizing it and making it more similar to the original Tengrism. Gichi Manatu, okay, the, and, oh, great, Anishina, you know that was happening soon, descended from the Algonquin-speaking Abnaki and Cree, inherited the great spirit tradition from their predecessors, Gichi Manatu, also transliterated as Gichi Manadu, is an Inisinabe language word typically interpreted as great spirit, the creator of all things and the giver of life and is sometimes translated as the great mystery. Historically, Ashinabe uh, people believed in a variety of spirits whose images were placed near doorways. Now, this is the thing. 
believing in a variety of spirits is not against monotheism or pantheism. What do I mean by that? Well, what you have to remember is this. Okay, individual people exist. Individual organisms exist. Okay? My cats exist. Other people exist. Okay? But that doesn't mean they're, they are not given life essence by the great, the quote, great spirit. Dig what I'm saying? So other uh, Anishinaabe names for such a figure incorporated through the process of syncretism are Gichi Manadu, Venerable Manadu, uh, Wen Shiad Manadu, Fair Manadu. Uh, this, this is similar to the 99 names of God, which is an Islamic concept, which was borrowed by the Franciscans. Contemporary religious significance uh, the Native American Church of North America, which I'm going to click on that in a second to show you this, because you'll remember I brought up the Native American Church of North America. Was I bullshitting you? No, I was not. So the Native American Church of North America, known as peyoteism and the peyote religion, is a Native American religion that teaches a combination of traditional Native American beliefs uh, merged with Christianity with sacramental use of peyote. The religion originated in the Oklahoma Territory in uh, 1890 to 1907 in the late 19th century after peyote was introduced to the southern Great Plains from Mexico. Today it is the most widespread indigenous religion among Native Americans in the United States except Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians. Native Hawaiians are Polynesian though. Uh, Canada, specifically First Nations people in Saskatchewan and Alberta and Mexico, with an estimated 20, uh, 250,000 adherents as of the late 20th century. So, syncretic, uh, religious syncretic Native American, uh, Kuna Parker was the founder. Origin, United States. Big Moon Peyoteism was the separation. It's like, I guess, their form of Protestantism. So, this is about the peyote road. And this is what you got to remember. The peyote road, there's two roads in life. There's the peyote road, which is twisty and narrow and easy to fall off of. And then there is the road of glut of the basically like the seven deadly sins. It's a big fat road. So that's the one that goes crosswise on the solar cross or the medicine wheel. And the other one, the peyote road, goes up and down between heaven and earth. So this is a peyote ceremonial TP. Historically, many denominations of mainstream, uh, mainstream Christianity attempted to convert American, Native Americans to Christianity, blah, blah, blah. We know all this. Beliefs of the church. So disease and death are believed to be the result of an imbalance in the individual. Besides peyote, other sacred plants, prayer and fasting are used to cure this imbalance. Uh, use of peyote, so this is again, this is a reorganization of shamanism back into something more organized. Use of peyote is never for recreational purposes, meaning people don't just do it to get high, and the hallucinogenic effects of the plant are considered spiritual visions. To most Native Americans, visions are a communion with the metaphysical. Uh, what you need to understand People that don't practice magic, or even people that do practice magic, are not understanding that what's going on here is not... <laughs> they like to call things metaphysical and physical. There is only the physical. There are different planes of the physical. Some of it we understand, and some of it we don't understand. The subtle body, or the body of light, uh, this is why people need to read shit like Aleister Crowley's books and stuff like that, so they can actually grasp what the fuck this stuff is. Um, we don't have a full measurable grasp of this stuff, but we know it exists because practitioners know it exists. The problem is, and it's not subjective, uh, people see and feel and hear the same things with or without talking to one another. So it's not as subjective as people think it is. Uh, but the plant is meant to heal, but that's the point. So there's no such thing as the metaphysical or the supernatural. There is only the physical and the natural. But there, are, for example, physical energy exists and physical matter exists. Now, there are many different vibrational levels. Okay? And that's the thing. Okay? 
Not every member experiences hallucinogenic effects during peyote rituals. The plant is, yeah, probably because they're not taking enough peyote. <laughs> the plant is meant to heal or fix social, personal, and communal problems. Members believe the plant is safe for children and pregnant women. I would not uh, do that, but whatever. Relationship to Christianity. Some American Indians or, Amer or American natives dislike the beliefs of Christianity because of the history between natives and European Christians. Missionaries, yada, 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 yada. On the other hand, some members are comfortable with the syncretic spiritual way that combines their indigenous beliefs and some of Christianity. Different fireplaces. There are two main umbrella fireplaces, ceremonial peyote altars passed down generationally from family to family, or from uh, from the family, that are concocted: the half moon fireplace and the cross fireplace. A uh, half moon fireplace uses a half moon shaped sand altar. Uh, the color of the sand size, the color of the sand and size used varying between tribes. Uses of t uses of tobacco and corn husks uh, during uh, main uh, sections of the uh, the service. Coal designed uh, coal design patterns differ from tribe to tribe during the service. Staff is passed around the TP during singing sections, yada, yada, yada. Uh, cross fireplace, these are different ways that the ritual is practiced, uses a horseshoe shaped sand altar and a, isn't a half moon? Wait. Oh, well, the, uh, it represents the grave of Christ. There is no tobacco used. The staff is placed upright in the ground. Bible sections are recited, yada, yada, yada national organizational structure. The Native American Church of North America, the original 1913 charter enabled in Oklahoma Territory, all, all chapters with this designation have no blood quantum requirements to attend ceremonies. So you can be of any race and attend these ceremonies. Most tribes that adopted, now the, the problem with that is, is the peyote usage. The federal government didn't like people using peyote. So the Native American Church of North America, which is an offshoot of the original 1913 organization, uh, d d d d requires people have at least one quarter Native American or more. Uh, this is enforced by tribal police via checking certificates of degree of Indian or Alaskan Native and uh, Native American Church membership cards while in the, mi in the minority nationally major community figures in the peyote world are actively involved and defend its decision to only allow Native Americans to attend. Ceremony and roles. Following, uh, followers of the Native American church have differing ceremonies, celebrations, and ways. Okay, you can read the rest of this on your own. That's the core. This is going into the different kind of music with the gourd rattle, water drum, and all that jazz. So what's Brahmanism? Remember I said there were a number of splits. The Indo-Aryans were the people that now make up India, Europe, and Iran. Okay. So Brahmanism, also known as the Vedic religion, remember it came from Central Asia, is the belief system where Tengrism came from. Uh, that developed from the Vetas during the late Vedic period, originating in the Indus Valley civilization. After the Indo-Aryan migration, at around 2000 to 1500 BC, it claims that the supreme being Brahman, which by the way is the supreme reality, again, this is the great spirit, it's just called Brahman to Hindus, and its tenets influenced the development of Hinduism, the Vedas were understood as the eternal words of the universe. The eternal words of the universe. The eternal words of the universe. Which had always existed and were not revealed. So this is, as I've stated, the original religion comes from nature, from man's observation of nature or from humans' observation of nature. I know people don't like gender-specific pronouns these days. So the being that spoke these words was the creator of the universe and the universe itself. The creator of the universe and the universe itself, the bornless one. In ceremonial magic, 
This is called the Bornless One, or God. Brahman and the Vedas were recognized as defining and Sanatan Dharma, the eternal order, which Brahman had established belief in the authority of the Vedas was encouraged by the priestly upper class, Brahmins who could read Sanskrit, the language of the Vedas, whereas the lower classes could not. The Brahmins, and this is where it went to shit, is because they started turning it into hoogie-boogie magical bullshit. So Brahmanism reforms led to the development of Hinduism, but it was saved by the creation of of the Upanishads and Buddhism. The Upanishads and Buddhism repurified it, and then Buddhism was tainted as Buddhism traveled around the world. Okay, so uh, blah, blah, blah. It's the philosophical basis of Sharvaka. I never heard of that one. Uh, Jainism and Buddhism uh, became the most well-established. Brahmanism continued to exert considerable influence in Hinduism and continues to do so in the present day. Origin and the Vedas, the date and place of origin for Vedic thought is unknown. I think they're not looking hard enough. I would say that it's not conclusively known, but I think that there's a lot of correlations between this and Tengrism. Okay. The Indo-Aryan migration suggests that the Vedic vision developed in uh, Central Asia, Okay, around the region of the Kingdom of Mitanni, modern-day northern Iraq, Syria, and Turkey, and arrived in India during the decline of the Indus Valley Civilization, sometime between 2000 and 1500 BCE. So, this common error. Now, the OIT claims the Indus Valley Civilization, blah, 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 Harappan Civilization, yada, yada... Brahman was understood as an individual entity, but so immensely powerful that the human mind could not comprehend it. So a number, remember, it is the universe and that which created the universe, that which created the universe and the universe, the bornless one. A number of God's names, notably Indra, were known in Central Asia. Remember, Indra is the thunder god similar to Thor of these people. And one of the most important concepts of Brahmanism is Rita, or cosmic order. Rita, 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 I don't know. But cosmic order, universal order, was also well established there. It is thought that sometime around the third millennium BCE, now as you can get, I'm going to get to this later, but what my point is, is there is not a political solution to the problems facing our people or people in general. The solution is to individually re-adopt a natural attitude, not necessarily a natural way of life, but a natural attitude. And that starts by understanding one's place in the universe. Okay? So, known as Indo-Iranians and Indo-Aryans parted ways, the Indo-Iranians settling the Iran Plateau, the Indo-Aryans continued south to India subcontinent, the term Aryan, was understood as a class of people meaning free or noble and had nothing to do with the race. Uh, it actually did because that's what the group of people were, was a race of people. The association of Aryan with light-skinned races was only made in the 18th and 19th centuries, blah, blah, blah. See, this is like what I said it, dude. Like, or dudes and dudesses. What you have to understand is anthropologists borrowed the word Aryan and associated it with light-skinned people. Because these people were light-skinned. Okay? Now, not light-skinned. We're talking about light-skinned light Caucasoid people. Okay? But this is the anthropologist taking a term, Aryan, and utilizing that term for their purposes. Scientists have been doing that for a long, 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 long time. 
Linguists have done that too with the word Aryan. So the Indus Valley civilization was among the most advanced of the ancient world. So does that mean, actually come to think of it, we know these things because of genetics now, as noted in my previous video of the Aryan invasion and that these people were the people that people thought they were. Uh, does that mean that the Aryan languages, the Indo-Aryan languages are not, uh, which include German and Gaelic and all that jazz, that, uh, that means that uh, these, uh, these languages somehow magically are not Indo-Aryan? That just doesn't matter? I don't know. So the Indus Valley civilization, which was Dravidian, was among the most advanced of the world. Now, this was a civilization made by Australoid people uh, and clearly had some form of religious observance, but because of their script remains undeciphered. Some people believe that the Romani have remnants of this belief system in their belief systems. This is showing the Aryan invasion. So the contents of the Vedas are passed down. So you have the Rig Veda, the Samaveda, the Yudhur Veda, this Veda, that Veda, the Brahmana, the Brahmanas, the da, 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 and the Upanishads. That's something that everyone needs to read. Precepts of Brahmanism. The Indo-Aryans are also known as the Vedic peoples. Who wrote these? Who wrote in Sanskrit? and whose religion and cosmographical vision is thought to have merged with that of the Indus Valley civilization. The Vedas moved the people's relationship with the supernatural from the day-to-day -day rituals of honoring spirits and quid pro quo, blah, 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 and the attempt at da, 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 Vedism in the attempt at answering the deepest questions of existence became Brahmanism. Once a first cause was identified. The Vedic sages recognized that the world operated according to rules. So it's based on naturalistic observations. If you do this, that happens. It's karma, baby. Okay? That's action and inaction. Inaction is action. Everything is action. The rules were defined as rita, cosmic order, and their existence implied a rule maker, okay? But one greater than the gods. So this is greater than, it's a god beyond the gods. This is like Tengra, except they called it Brahman. Brahman was understood as an individual entity, but so immensely powerful that the human mind couldn't comprehend it without ample amounts of marijuana. No, I'm just joking, that's not there. This being existed in reality, it could be apprehend it outside of reality in a realm of pre-existence. So it existed in a state of pre-existence. Note the similarity between this and Genesis in the Bible. Okay, Brahman had always existed and would always exist. So the universe has always been here. Before the Big Bang ever happened, the universe was here. It just didn't exist in its current incarnation. It was not thought possible that the source of all life would create life without also providing for a way to commune with it. The human being was understood to be made up of a body, a soul, a mind. Okay, the Vedic sages added an oversolar, the Atman, the true self, the actualized self. That allows connection with Brahman. This is the part of you that is connected to Brahman. Okay? So, uh, every human being was understood to be carrying this spark of divinity within them. Just as each individual carried this divine spark, so too the many gods were all Brahman's different aspects. Everything is an aspect of Brahman. Brahman is the universe. So recognize that Brahman, da da da, da 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 da, you can read this on your own. Brahmanism and Hinduism are unimportant. Hinduism is an impure form of Brahmanism. So we're coming back full circle here, aren't we? So transcendentalism, or New England transcendentalism to be more accurate, is a philosophy that originated in New England. 
Okay, so what this is about, the core belief is that inherent goodness of people and nature, and while society and its institutions have corrupted the purity of the individual, people are at their best when truly self-reliant and independent. Transcendentalists saw divine experience inherent in the everyday rather than believing in a distant heaven. So what they're saying is that divinity is present in everything, every day. Transcendentalists saw physical and spiritual phenomenon as, a, as part of the same dynamic process rather than, dis, uh, than discrete entities. Transcendentalism is one of the first philosophical currents that emerged in the USA. Okay? It is therefore a key early point in the history of American philosophy, emphasizing subjective intuition over objective empiricism. Its adherents believe that individuals are capable of generating completely original insights with little attention and defense to past masters. It arose as a reaction to protest against the general state of intellectualism and spirituality at the time. The doctrine of the Unitarian Church, as taught at Harvard, Uni at Harvard Divinity School, was closely related. Transcendentalism emerged from English and German Romanticism, uh, and bib the biblical criticism of Johann Gottfried Herder uh, and Friedrich whatever, the, the skepticism of David Hume and the transcendental philosophy of Immanuel Kant and German idealism. Perry Miller and blah, 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 and Immanuel Swedenborg and such and such and blah, blah, blah. So transcendentalism is closely related to Unitarianism. Okay, a religious movement in Boston uh, in the early 19th century. It started to develop after Unitarianism took hold at Harvard University. Following the elections of Henry Ware as the Holus Professor of Divinity in 1805 and of John Thornton, uh, Thornton Kirkland as president in 1810. Transcendentalism was not a rejection of Unitarianism. Rather, it developed as an organic consequence of the Unitarian emphasis on free consciousness or free conscious and the value of intellectual reason. Now, in my next video, I am going to discuss Biologic Living by uh, John Harvey Kellogg. Okay, so I will be discussing Biologic Living by Dr. Kellogg in my next video. And that's all for this one.